Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is our session two of the PhD showcase. And while we were looking before the short break at the previous session at collections, sites, and archive, the sort of meticulous, careful examination, recreation in some cases of objects uh, and buildings. In this panel, we're focusing on sound, space, and landscape. So still looking at some of those questions, but maybe turning um, our attention also to the surrounding environment, both virtual and real, and how also intangible heritage and, and other elements sort of play into the mix. We have a range of really interesting talks. Uh, we have Lisa Olson first from the University of Aberdeen, Department of Music, so interesting uh, variety of subjects as well. Lizzie Robertson from the University of Glasgow is from archaeology. Shona Noble and Marley Mudeni Samuel are both from Glasgow School of Art, uh, working at the School of Simulation and Visualization, looking at different aspects of this. So I will start, we'll start with Liz first talking about immersive soundscapes, so she can start sharing the screen while I read you the rest of the title, exploring the embodied experience of the in-between. On to you, please. We can see this fine, so you should be yeah. okay. I'm exploring ambisonics and 3D sound technologies to compose immersive sound experiences questioning how immersive technologies are changing our concepts of space and time, developing methods for non-linear narrative, and examining the interrelationship embodiment has between the body and the technology. An immersive soundscape surrounds a listener in a three-dimensional sonic environment. We listen to immersive sound similar to how we listen to the world. Our experience is naturally an immersive one. The body is within a space while listening. My project uses theory and practice-based research. I'm questioning what in-between experiences can be created within an immersive soundscape. And I have identified many ambivalent and in-between categories as discussed by artists, philosophers and musicologists. When listening to immersive sound, in-between experiences happen. It has an ambiguous nature, it is elusive and often goes unnoticed. I'm observing, highlighting and presenting them within my work. My process involves composing sound, voices and field recordings. I often use an H3 VR ambisonic mic, as seen in the slide. It's very portable and it's a way to capture 360 degree audio. I can also recreate spatial elements of sound using the ambisonic plugins. For this example is a Harpex plugin um, I use for Reaper. It is a signal processing algorithm designed to extract the maximum amount of spatial information from the sound. You will see the representation of the circle um, with the locations of energy and location of the sound within that circle. This, can also, this technology can also use to transform recordings into different formats. For example, 3D uh, surround sound formats for film and television or high order Ambiex for VR and AR applications. So my journey began for my PhD, I joined Rough Mix. This opportunity built on my experience of interdisciplinary teamwork. My focus worked on immersive sound and it gave me insight into how sound can subtly add something or command a live performance. I became aware of audience focus. It is very notable, noticeable if a sound is wrong. But when the immersive sound experience works, it reveals and conceals itself within the performance. The Land of Forgot is a play created in response to Climate Crisis written by Leslie Wilson. I produced an immersive soundscape for this production to explore an immersive experience for live performance. 
During the performance, the audience attention was on the stage where the protagonist describes a society that has, a, that has forgotten the wilderness. The 3D spatial arrangement positioned the sound within the sphere. The extended optimal listening area presented sounds of a stream, buzzing bees and percussion instruments. A harp played a melonic tune at the front, front of the sound feet sphere. This melody was interrupted by other sounds of a distant storm, a morning chorus and rustling trees. The performance toured Scotland in 2019 and it built on my knowledge of ambisonic sound setup in different venues. For example, if a venue has a 5.1 surround sound setup, you decode the ambisonic file to 5.1. This same sound file can be decoded to stereo, binaural or any other speaker arrangement. The audience feedback revealed that the 3D soundscape added the illusion of being in an imagined place. For some, this was an emotional experience. The sounds they encountered moved between sensory signals of space, knowledge and memories. The Active Listening Project um, is a project I work on, explored immersive sound experiences for children and it was delivered alongside RSPB activities at Quarry Mill in Perthshire. Quarry Mill is a woodland walk. It also has historical significance with connection to Robert the Bruce and local legend links Quarry Mill to the Stone of Destiny. My project activities included a sound recording workshop, a sound walk experience, an immersive sound composition and a 360 video using Google Cardboard, a cheap alternative to a VR headset. This made it affordable and accessible. My intention was to discover how immersive 3D sound technologies can be used to deliver the RSPB's public engagement and educational activities. However, um, all events were cancelled um, due to lockdown. So the audience feedback was limited, but the development during um, the feedback during development revealed that listening to a 3D soundscape allowed a listener to embrace their environment by directing attention to face-to-face -face interactions. A child's listening moves in between focusing and blurring, and the experience of the 360 video revealed for many of these children from a wide range of backgrounds, uh, this was their first time they had ever experienced a virtual world. The child understands and objectifies the representation of the woodland and anything the imagination can conceive is possible. So in March 2020, all planned events and community work for my research has been cancelled, but this changed, this changed many people's lives. I believe that anthropologist Victor Turner would describe this as a liminal space. We are threshold people, disorientated and in between. As lockdown restrictions continued, I start to think of COVID friendly research. Every day I spent looking out my window, uh, observing wildlife and the eerie silence of my world. The landscape has changed it's a pause and an in-between space. So I'm now working on a project called The Land Beyond My Window, or Land Beyond Our Window. I'm using qualitative research to explore ambiguity, strange events, and in-between feelings. My research methods in view use ambisonic field recordings, zoom interviews, and 3D sound production to explore sound, storytelling, to emanate the sound of a pandemic. A diverse selection of participants across Scotland were interviewed on Zoom to create a platform to discuss perception and observation of time, space in the presence of others. I feel this project has cultural significance because it's happening right now. Interviewing during the pandemic and on Zoom affected the engagement. People were more willing to share. It could be the lack of social interaction or the fact that their interviews were being in their own home. All the participants had a lot to say. 
Zoom audio has latency issues. However, it does represent the sound of a pandemic. It's been common practice on the BBC to use Zoom for over a year. I now have an archive of interviews and immersive sounds to disseminate. Challenges. I'm starting to explore middleware for gaming platforms, that's WIs and F mode. To explore this software, I'm also building on my knowledge of Unity. This technology has a steep learning, learning curve and can be incredibly frustrating. Working from home has been an issue. Immersive sound can create large files. At time, my laptop processing power is pushed to the limit. Some, some of the technology I'd like to use for my project is beyond my budget. And I've also had to rethink my relationship with narrative, move away from a linear process and start thinking other ways of how, I can, um, how we can experience 3D narrative. In conclusion, my PhD journey has embraced uncertainty, is a work in progress, and I'm excited and intrigued by the possibilities immersive sound technologies present. And my email is down there and I'm open to collaboration. So stop sharing. This is great, Liz. Thank you so much. And I was really intrigued to hear about sounds of the pandemic. So because a lot of us alluded to this, but actually how you can use it also creatively and constructively to help people reflect and come to terms with it was really interesting. Um, if Lizzie could start getting her slides ready, um, it was really nice. Also, I think there's some things we're going to come back to, like storytelling and also accessibility and maybe affordability of this. The next project is also about recreating sound um, and place and the Scottish Highlands, because the panel is going to move from, from Highlands to Namibia and, and anything in between. So I'll pass on to Lizzie to tell us more about her research. Hi there. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, the talks have all been really interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to some of the participants. Um, so yes, my research is on recreating sound and place in Scottish Highland landscapes. Um, and today I'm going to tell you a bit about my case study at Glencoe. Um, so some of the sort of research questions that I'm interested in looking at through my research, um, yeah, creating landscape scale immersive sound experiences what what does it mean to sort of create these on a landscape scale um when we've got places such as glencoe you really want to incorporate as much of that experience into your immersive interactive experience as possible um and you know how can elements such as like site specific performance or you know how can we kind of archaeology heritage borrow from these dis different disciplines have already kind of explored themes like this um, into immersive experiences. Um, ways in which audio reconstructions and engagements uh, can engage with audiences in meaningful ways. Um, so I guess kind of stripping back the form of the more visually dominant um, approaches that from the you know, from cultural heritage, um, how can how can audio reconstructions kind of what can they offer um, audiences when they're already kind of confronted with a very sort of rich um, and meaningful uh, visual representation in front of them in the in the very physical form? I've kind of just covered that. How does this differ to visual? I think something that I've been really interested in um, coming from an archaeological background is the sort of lack of visual presence of the of the archaeology underfoot um, and the sort of how to sort of um, oralize this um, and, and how this kind of plays this sort of auditory presence versus just kind of what we consider a desolate sort of landscape, although I will kind of go into that a bit more. I think it's more complex than that. Um, and yes, this kind of promotion of more nuanced interactions and interpretations of place, I guess, kind of rather than a lot of people at the minute, maybe just experience um, 
the landscape of Glencoe, kind of driving through it, walking through it. But what what um what can it mean to be out in the landscape, interpreting the lumps and bumps in the landscape and and as archaeology? Um, so my kind of approach from an immersive audio perspective has been kind of informed by sonic artists such as Hildegard Westerkamp and Jeanette Cardiff, um, just to name a few. I guess they've kind of really, I guess it was these sound artists that when sound ecologists that were really kind of exploring the medium of of immersion in audio. Um, it's kind of been said that um, um, that headphones are kind of an early form of, of immersive hardware in a way. So it kind of I really like this idea of kind of going back to the sort of bare bones of of what we can do with um, augmented reality, um, XR and stuff like that. Um, they're, they're also integral component to games. Um, they kind of lend themselves to emotional elements, but also kind of the actions that the player is undertaking or sort of where they are in the game, if they're in a sort of enclosed space or a or cavernous space um, and as I was saying just there acoustics can be reproduced um, to give um, sense of space and place um, and these sort of unique acoustical qualities that that, that places have. Um, so sound and heritage um, this is just a very whistle stop tour because um, it's obviously a lot more complex than this but I guess I kind of started with the traditional audio tour um, and this very nice um, advert here. It kind of um, came to the forefront of cultural heritage organizations. Well, they started using them in the 50s, um, but they kind of provided a very sort of didactic interpretation of place or subject matter. Um, and I guess um, traditional kind of exhibition techniques using sound installation in exhibitions or heritage experiences kind of my mind goes to the Jorvik experience or um, I think the Calvin Grove had um, some sort of background noises in some of their early people's galleries um, and really this is kind of about sort of supplementing the experience providing atmosphere providing context but um, more and more it's been increasingly a focal point um, and a sort of main event to heritage interpretation um, and these heritage spaces um, and I guess these different forms have lent from have built on I guess the works of uh, Jeanette Cardiff um, and um, Hildegard Westerkamp uh, with sort of creative sound arts um, within a heritage context um, geolocative, um, site-specific, and then reconstructing past acoustic spaces. Um, Stuart earlier was talking a bit about some of the work at Fingal's Cave, um, but there's work done at the University of York and University of Edinburgh as well. Um, I've got links to the end if people want to look at those, but um, immersive audio in my research here is me standing at Signal Rock in Glencoe, actually looking the wrong way. I not looking down the right glen, but you get the gist. Um, so I'm kind of thinking of a blend of AR and XR um, and the sort of sound installation. I haven't really formalized what exactly the technical kind of labeling of my experience will be because I, I don't really personally want to be limited by that but I guess at, um, at the core I am augmenting a user's experience of landscape with sound um, and but arguably the sort of the place itself is as important as these layers that are being added through sound and you know the possibilities for chance encounters with local like like um, people kind of wandering through the landscape, but also kind of the sounds of the motorway and other sort of things going on are as equally important to the story. Um, and yeah, so creation of spatialized content. Lisa, um, just to hit on this, um, I guess this is really important in terms of um, kind of localizing yourself and creating a sort of digital audio space that that my users will navigate around um 
just because um, visually there isn't a lot there. I'm probably basing my work um, at this site at Achtriachten, um, which kind of has potentially some um, some remains of sites that were kind of contemporaneous with the massacre. So um, I guess trying to sort of build up acoustically and sort of auditory what what the um the space would have been like um and yes yeah, so as i said here you using acoustics to maybe reconstruct turf houses or other structures and sort of um kind of get people immersed in these in these acoustic spaces whilst they're not visually present um so yeah the why glencoe i guess um i was attracted to it because of these very sort of traditional romantic narratives that kind of surround the um the glen itself the stories of massacre um the sort of mcdonald's of uh, glencoe being um um killed by the the campbells this sort of traditional story that is become very nationally important story and internationally, I guess, as the sort of um, the audiences are wide reaching. But um, in reality, um, you kind of you drive along the roads and um, you've got the very noisy A82 um, when you're standing there. And I think that some people would be disappointed by this because I think they'd think that that's not the authentic experience. But then I really want to kind of explore this authenticity in my work and sort of kind of arguably what was probably quite noisy landscapes at the time. Um, so very quickly going through my methodology, I'm kind of recollecting and recreating sounds of the landscape from the 17th, 18th century, kind of through looking through the audio archives provided by Ambali and Topar and Dolkis and engaging with these uh, Gallic stories. Um, it kind of got this wonderful collection that needs to be used really. Um, and then looking at traditional farming processes that were pre-improvement, um, threshing, using cornstone, walking the cloth, the incorporations of songs into these as well. Um, these these are all very noisy processes and kind of almost in, kind of industrial sounding processes in a way. Um, and I guess I'm kind of thinking about how that lends into um, into soundscape creation, composition. And then there's the process of me collecting sounds in the landscape. Um, my old field practice kind of going from iPhone to kind of going up market. Um, what I'm recording in the landscape, it's all part of the creative process um, at, the, at the moment of capture. Yeah, and the sort of technological practices involves. Um, and then the sort of creation and experimentation with soundscapes and acoustics um, kind of going forward into sort of pulling these uh, sounds together um, composing, but also thinking about how I communicate abstract concepts through sounds, sorts of geology, archaeological site formation processes and ecological change. Um, Liz, if you and could yeah. wrap up maybe. Oh yeah, because sorry. we're running a little bit out of time. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yes. So just to wrap up, that um, will kind of be the formation processes of my methodology, um, but it's all very much a process still. And um, yeah, I'm happy to hear or answer questions at the after the talks on that. And thank you for listening. That's great. Thank you so much. This is great to, to look at sound and how it affects our relationship and experience on the landscape from, from a different perspective. If Shona could start preparing her slides next, um, we're going to look at other worlds um, and non-material different forms of cultural, cultural heritage now. We can yeah. see them okay, Shona, now we lost them again. Oh, sorry, I just forgot to click the share sound. I'm just gonna... Okay. Okay, is that them back? It's taking a second, but it's in the cross. Yes, we can see them now. Okay. So, um, yes. Is that good? Off you go, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, thank you um, so much for having me. I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation. Um, 
So I'm in the School of Simulation and Visualization at the Glasgow School of Art. And I'm in my first year of my project, which is called The Digital Other World. And I want to start with this map, which shows the tidal island of Balashir in the Western Isles of Scotland. The name translates as Eastern Village, but it is situated on the west coast of North Youth. So the name seems inappropriate given its location, but could it give us clues to hidden information? And this quote tells us why. So situated west from the shores of North Youth, the remains of the buildings are visible under a clear sky and low tide. They are said to have been the dwellings of the people who inhabited the Mackers now under the sea. It is interesting and curious to find submerged sites over the now wide and open sea still called by their place names. A skier and Hlion, the barrier rock, the site of a floodgate and others. Along the western margin of these islands, Atlantic waves roll over the remains of dikes, duns, swellings, kilns, and churches, which can still be recognized as such, together with undeterminable masonry and old burial grounds. And another keeper of this kind, oh, sorry, wait, I want to go back. Because <laughs> um, what I want to say here is that, um, so there's two, what it's saying is there's two townships which are now completely submerged by the Atlantic. They're called Husvos and Balashir, which is the west village to Balashir's east. And the point I'm trying to make here is that maps hold data that can give us an insight into vestiges of the past and clues to data that might not be visible on first glance. And another keeper of this kind of information is in oral tradition and folklore. For example, this recording held in the Tobarun Dalkish archive of audio heritage. So I'm just going to play a little clip of that. Um, let me know if you can't hear it. I'm going to go to the Balashir and go to the Balashir. I'm going to go to the Balashir and go to the Balashir. I'm going to go to the Balashir. Um, so he was telling us that there was a village called Balashir indeed, but it's now under the sea and he never saw it himself, but he's telling us who told him about it. And these islands and the folklore surrounding them are full of culturally rich information, which is passed from generation to generation. However, there are certain parallels with the incoming tide threatening the landscape as it, as it is known now, with the rise of digital threatening oral culture and heritage. And oral tradition is a vast and culturally rich resource in Scotland. In his introduction to the Gallic other world, Black writes that there is not one but three Gallic other worlds, each of which is separately populated by the fairies, spirits and witches. Though very different in themselves, all three other worlds attempt to probe the mysteries of time and space. And spatiality is key here, not only physically in terms of the context of the landscape, but also carving out space within the digital realm. With digital being an ever presence in modern lives, I'd like to reconnect the two and I'd like to do it through the medium that is both very physical and very visual, which is mapping. And maps are a great way of visualizing data. It's interesting to compare different maps. For example, if you compare a road map of Glasgow with an Aboriginal map, both are describing the landscape and how we as humans move through it, but they are represented very differently visually. And there are many hundreds of layers of information that may be included on a map or left off depending on its use. And sometimes a lot of this content is invisible to people who are passing through and is only visible to those who live and work there. 
I want to play in this and use augmented reality to overlay data on the physical landscape that tells us more about the people of the past through the people that live there now. This is an artwork by Derek Lerner. And it's an example of how digital sculpture and drawing can be placed in situ and interacted with. And the digital realm in this context can be thought of as a medium for revealing the hidden layers of information and meaning in the landscape. And another way of storytelling in immersives is using animation. Or less by Leslie Keane is an example of how it can be layered over a real world context. The film is set in Pollock Park, which is the location of the Borough Collection Art Gallery. In the words of the artist, the spirits of the works in the collection escape by day to play in the park and are gathered up each evening to return to the objects which they are supposed to inhabit, making it a play on the meaning of the word animate. And another medium that I'm going to be drawing on is um, theatre and set design. I think it's a good way of creating atmosphere and content for a digital space. As set design are artworks that are layered and create 3D spaces that can be moved through and that shift and change for storytelling purposes. The challenge for digital space is making it look good from all angles. And I have, so I have said that my research project transcends the boundaries of the physical and the digital. And in this sense, I see the digital other world as being a map that can only be explored if you're out in the physical landscape. And one of my initial experiments is building an app that notifies you when you're in the vicinity of the location of an other world reference. I like the idea of being out and about and exploring the landscape and suddenly you get a notification to your phone letting you know about a story that arose in that location. Trying to evoke, for example, a visit from a fairy here. Uh, this is something that, <clears throat> sorry, this is something that usually appears to you. You don't seek it for yourself. And these are some very quick experiments I wanted to do with technology that is widely available and relatively easy to use. First is just with a free AR app that comes included with Android phones these days. Something that is accessible and easy to use and allows you to write and draw in 3D in the landscape. And the second is an experiment with layered animation frames placed in context. So whether the storytelling is done through abstract methods or literally written on the landscape, the most important part is that the stories are told by the people in ways they wish to tell them. And with the specific focus of mapping folklore to the landscape, my challenges as I see them now are these. Can these technologies enable more people to meaningfully engage with and reconsider their experience of folklore in the landscape? In the context of heritage visualization, is there a way of working with the technologies that is inclusive and beneficial to all? And can the use of digital technologies in this context enable more ethical tourist economies and sustain creative economies locally. And I'd really like to finish with this quote, um, which just says, fairies are mythical mediators between man and nature in its wild state. They are avatars of the other world, of all that is mysterious about our existence. We do not have to believe in the culture specific form that they take to understand the process of negotiation between man and nature. And what can go wrong when the negotiation goes wrong? Global warming, flooding, loss of biodiversity. There's nothing fanciful about that debate. So my project explores the boundaries of the human and the other. It explores the ways in which non-digital forms of heritage can be creatively rendered using digital technologies. But I will also critically reflect on the use of digital technologies in not only becoming a new access point for folklore, but assess its ability to support the potential genesis of new folklore and encourage its use in support of local economies.
thank you so much for listening. Um, I'd be interested if anyone has any questions or comments, to share them in the Q&A. Do thank you so much, Shona. This was really great. Do put for all the speakers in the chat any comments or questions you have, because we will gather them afterwards in the discussion. This was really fascinating, and I think it's um, the questions about sustainability and the uh, interpretation, uh, although in a very different geographical landscape. Moving now to Namibia, uh, are also appearing in the next talk in Marley's presentation on the intersection of technology and ocean cultural heritage. We can see the slides fine, Marley. So up uh, on to you. Just unmute your microphone. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's great, okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my name is Mali Modenis Samuel, and I'm doing my PhD at the Glasgow School of Arts. And my research is being funded by the UK Research and Innovation Center in conjunction with the One Ocean Hub. Um, my topic today is the intersection of technology and ocean cultural heritage in a Namibian case study. Just to tell you a little bit about Namibia. So Namibia is a diverse country in the southwestern part of Africa, and it is very rich in cultural heritage, and it has a dynamic ocean area. And my research explores communities in these Namibian coastal towns that are part of the um, coastal socio-ecological system, researching on unrealized potential for communities to benefit and learn from their own heritage and ocean connections that they have with the ocean for livelihood sustainability and to enhance um, communities through ocean literacy, but importantly, for knowledge preservation. So the research is being conducted in four major ocean towns in Namibia, namely Swakopmund, Balthus Bay, Hentis Bay, and Luderitz. So what is it that I'm actually looking into to its connection place, connection with the ocean? Most of the coastal communities have longstanding cultural um, and emotional connections with the ocean. So be it a lot of benefits financially, culturally, emotionally, physically. There are a lot of benefits. However, I'm looking into the cultural ties and the relationships that the communities have with the ocean and also trying to understand their past experiences and memories that they share with the ocean and whether they shaped or shaped their current livelihoods. Um, over the years, a lot of researchers have been collaborating with communities to leverage technology in a lot of spectrums. And in this case, to preserve indigenous knowledge or knowledge. So the research explores the role of ocean cultural heritage and ocean knowledge preservation through technology that is extended to reality in what sense? To come up with digital productions of the ocean connections that they have with the ocean, but also the significance of the creations or connections that they come up with, further examining the technology that is being used and how it is a tool, an empowering tool for ocean literacy and knowledge preservation in this context. The research is going to be studying existing technologies that are currently being used to support cultural heritage and knowledge preservation, um, trying to draw from the benefits and challenges that they have faced over um, the course of their studies, and also how they were implemented in the context, especially when working with communities, and then doing a comparison on how these technologies, especially extended reality in, in this context, can be implemented in other communities, that is now Swakopmund, Valpes Bay, and Bay, and Swakopmund in, in Namibia. Um, so in the picture, we have Tate Shoti. He's one of the participants I've worked with in previous projects, and he's going through a virtual reality um, heritage project. He's a sun person, and one of the biggest projects or one of the biggest cultural traits they have is um, rock painting. So in the virtual reality um, space, they got to kind of paint on the walls or on a rock that took them back to the olden ways that they used to live, which is rock painting. My research questions are, um, in what ways can ocean literacy and cultural heritage preservation contribute towards sustainable livelihoods and improved ocean conservation? And what techniques do communities use to express the connection that exists between them and the ocean? And how can their expressions be represented through technology? Then how can technology be used 
to simulate and preserve cultural heritage and ocean indigenous knowledge. I'll be using um, research through design as well as um, transdisciplinary research as overarching methodologies complemented by participatory and community-based design. Why exactly? That's because these methodologies ensure engagement of communities through the design process, but individuals in the whole design process are also able to gain a few skills, certain skills um, that they didn't have. Um, we'll also be work, I'll also be working um, with focus groups, having interviews, doing observations, and having questionnaires to understand the connection that exists between the participants and the ocean. So participants will be asked to express their connection to the ocean, and this expression can be um, used or represented in any cultural or art form. It can be a picture, it can be a painting, it can be a story, or it can be a poem. And then also dig deep into the importance of their specific expression, why they chose that expression, and how it relates back to the connection they have with the ocean. Based on a study that was conducted last year in December with the communities, um, there are many ocean heritage um, beliefs that are practiced in Namibia by the, in the coastal towns by different ethnic groups. Some of them are similar and others are very different. Um, Maman explains that heritage or culture is perceived differently by everyone. So I perceive cultural heritage differently and the next person perceives it differently. However, the ocean brings with it a lot of benefits. And as I stated earlier, it can be financial, it can be physical, it can be cultural, it can be emotional. But on the right, we have a picture that's Miss Elizabeth and she's drilling holes into seashells in order for her to create um, cultural beads that I used at a lot of traditional events, um, more like the one I'm wearing right now here. It's also made out of seashells. And they make this ornaments for traditional use, but also for sustainability and financial gain. But what are the research outputs that I'm looking for in my research? It's the cultural or art forms that is represented and that represents the connection between the people in the ocean. For example, if someone were to come up with um, this, this is called Onyoka, as Onyoka um, is the representation they have to the ocean. Why did they come up with it? Why did they create it? And what is that connection that links them or the Onyoka back to the ocean? And then also get oral testimonies that narrate the significance of their expressions. Now, the two, has, the two are going to be combined and then embedded in technology which will come up with a digital production of their expression. So for example, when you, you take one of the um, cultural art forms and um, hover an, an augmented app over it, the oral story and testimony starts talking or it, it starts narrating, explaining exactly what that art form is, how it connects the people back to the ocean and what is that significant or importance of the connection that exists. Um, these are just a few pictures of benefits. On the left, we have um, a woman who's washing her feet in the ocean. It represents going to the ocean to show respect whenever you visit an ocean town. And to the right is an engagement of uh, one of my friends. And she's wearing the, um, the, so the chain you see she's wearing around her waist is also made out of seashells. And it's worn at um, traditional weddings before you go and have your white wedding. What are some of the challenges being faced when it comes to technology in that regard? We're currently in the digital age and uh, there are a lot of challenges being faced. Yes, there's a lot of strides that have been taken or um, advantages of technology in some parts of the world, but in others, there's still so many strides that needs to be taken. For example, inclusivity and leaving no one behind when it comes to um, digital age. And another challenge is now lack of technological infrastructure in some of the communities that I'll be working with. The people won't really have access to technological infrastructure. And in that, um, we'll probably have to, the research will have to provide maybe phones and other technologies for them to use and for them to also engage. And importantly is decolonizing technology. So the technology that is being presented to 
the participants to the communities? Is it, is it a technology that they necessarily want to use? Are they familiar with it? And even if they are familiar, unfamiliar with it, how do we then create a foundation for them to be familiar with the technology so that that technology um, further gives back to them for development and empowerment. On top of that, again, biases when working with communities, but yeah, these are some of the challenges. Um, yeah, and just to, to end, the challenges cannot really stop the processes from going. We need to continue one way or another because the stories need to be told and the heritage needs to be preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marley. This was great. Uh, thank you to all the speakers from the panel. This was a really interesting variety of topics. Um, while um, if you have any comments from, from all of you, you can put it in the chat, but while you're maybe taking a moment to think, I wanted to pick up on, on some threads that um, you all seem to have addressed for all speakers uh, slightly differently and in a complementary way. Um, you talked about accessibility and affordability, especially Liz at the beginning, and Marley at the end about the inclusivity and the lack of the tech and the infrastructure. And um, Lizzie also mentioned how her the kit that she's using herself and what she's trying to do in helping us to experience sound in different ways. And Shauna talked about really interesting creative ways of bringing it all together. So I was wondering this challenge that some of the speakers in the in the in the morning. You've muted yourself, Maria. I managed to, to talk while moving my hand, so I pressed the keyboard wrong. So speaking about challenges, I managed to challenge myself in the middle of the sentence. Um, whether the, the challenge of the infrastructure and the tech um, actually is in some ways for the four projects, part of what you're researching and including um, in the context that you're looking at. I don't know who wants to pick it up. <laughs> You're all being too polite. Um, Maria, do you just repeat the question again? Sure, I was talking about the challenges of the tech and you, the, the different, different ways you looked at how this affects your end users and how the accessibility to that affects sustainability as well. But for all four of you as researchers, I was wondering whether this technological challenge was also part of what you're researching and looking at within your projects? Um, I actually didn't look at it from that point of view as in the technological um, challenge, but okay. So the one area that I was looking at because uh, I'll, I'll probably be working with informal communities is just the lack of access to infrastructure, to technological infrastructure and whether the participants will um, have knowledge on how to use some of these technologies. So these are some of the challenges I was looking into. But yes, definitely, I think that's something that I'll be looking into right now. Shauna, you were moving your head when I was talking, so was there a different perspective from you? Yeah, for me, the challenge is um, how can the technologies be used to really contextualize the content the content that I'm looking at and how can it be experienced in situ that's the really important point that I'm looking at and also because I'll be working with communities in the Highlands so what are the challenges with the technologies themselves in terms of like things like internet connection and lack of experience and um, awareness and things like that. Yeah, great. Did Liz or Lizzie want to say anything about that? I think um, when it comes to um, sound in particular um not having the high-end equipment has make does make you extremely resourceful so you will you will find a way to produce high quality work um so there's no there's no hiding um there's no hiding behind your recordings if ultimately whether you're using something cheap or whether you're using something high-end um, a good quality recording um is is, is what you're actually looking for. And that's actually in the, the process of you actually recording, you know, um, whether there's wind or whether there's there's clicking, you you become very aware of um, any nuances or things that could affect a sound. And you just find ways of 
overcoming that and you find um, plugins that will maybe take hisses away and and you you work harder I think that's really interesting Lizzie did you did you have any comment from your perspective um I think I think just kind of building on what people have said um I I would say that I've kind of met some of my own sort of uh, technological challenges in terms of getting kit I guess um being in the archaeology department that there wasn't necessarily this sort of um the the sort of audio recorders and stuff like that so I, I guess kind of you're you're developing your own um personal practice and you're kind of going up but I think it would be nice to sort of enable people to through my work to kind of approach it from even if you've just got like an iPhone recorder or something like that and, and do some of these kind of soundscape compositions. Um, yeah. Ian put a comment that was very similar to what I was thinking in the chat about the intangible aspect that that's a common theme across the experience. Marley, you have a question from Meg asking you about the major changes in coastal communities. So the changes in fishing economies or erosion, some of which are very much to our heart in Scotland, the communities in the debate the last few years, but it, they're not just Scottish, they, they go much beyond the way you showed as well. So the question was about, um, are you particularly interested in capturing the local or ind indigenous attitudes towards that? Um, there are definitely a few changes that are, are going on when it comes to um, the fishing economy, um, especially for the small fishing communities. Um, my study is fo focusing on the bigger fishing communities, mostly the small fishing communities, and there were plenty of challenges that they are facing in regard to um, how the big fishing companies are fishing and how that kind of takes away from their livelihoods because then there's a change in attitude in the fish and how they migrate from point A to point B. And because of that, they are not catching as much fish as they used to anymore. But also on the role of governance, how some of the rules around fishing is being governed that the information about it doesn't really flow specifically to the informal communities or to the specific small scale fishes themselves. So it kind of, um, the information kind of circulates at a, a higher ground, but it doesn't really come down to the people who need their information. Um, uh, so yes, some of the indigenous attitudes that the fishing communities have towards um, fishing so, for example, if someone um, has an idea of when they are going to fish, why they are going to fish then, and someone in another town doesn't know, then this is knowledge that they could all share together and kind of learn from one another, creating like a, a library of knowledge, a, li a fishing library of knowledge that they could all learn from. Ian's comment, in the interest of time, I won't ask all four of you to put, but it's something, it's actually good to finish the session with more questions than statements. I think like all good sessions and all good PhDs actually, um, but it's something for all the speakers and I think and participants and for all of us working in this area is how do you make choices about what to represent and how, which is really paramount when you're working with cultural heritage and immersive, because there's so many different possibilities. And thank you to all of this session speakers as well as the speakers and attendants for, for the whole day about the so interesting and varied contributions to how you might go exploring some of this.